Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Acts video. Are right, you guys have been loving the fat electrician videos I've been covering recently? And I don't blame you because the stories are awesome and he's hilarious. So I've been getting more and more recommendations and a lot of them have been for this video, which is called America Obliterates Half of Iran's Navy in Eight Hours, Operation Praying Mantis. So I'm excited to learn about it coming from him. And you know, I'm going to bring in some context along the way. All right, the original video is down below. This has been very popular. Make sure you support it. It's got 2.4 million views in two months. So make sure to follow him and sub to him. And I've got some other videos covering him too, so love to have you around as well. All right, let's get started. Here we go. Yes, the time that the U.S. Navy got upset and destroyed half of Iran's entire naval fleet in a single eight-hour workday. <laughs> Today we're talking about Operation Praying Mantis. But real quick, this video is sponsored by Zydax Custom Gaming PCs. They are all built right here in America with American-based tech support and a lifetime warranty. It's the Powered computer the that Nic I use and the one that I would recommend. Slime. I'll have them linked down below if you want to check them out. <laughs> Let's get to this video. All right, important background info. 1980, Iraq decided to invade Iran. Why? Don't really care. Not pertinent to the story. However, at the... Oil. Land disputes over very, very important oil locations. Um, that shared that border. At the end of that war, Iran decides, hey, we're gonna pull a page out of the old art of war by Sun Tzu. We're gonna cut off the enemy supply lines, deprive the enemy of nice things. It's gonna work out great. Iraq's got a weak Navy. We're gonna wipe out their Navy. And then every time they send out an oil tanker through the Persian Gulf, we're gonna blow that up. So they can't sell any liquid dinosaur. They can't make any money. <laughs> they go broke. We win the war. Hooray. It's a solid plan. So they do exactly liquid that. Then Kuwait that. comes out of left field and they're like, hey, we've been financially backing Iraq through this entire war for the past seven years we need to make sure they win so we can get our money back so we're gonna go ahead and let iraq use our oil tankers to export oil so, so yeah this is when the united states starts being aware and stuff of uh, saddam hussein um iraq's gonna uh well it's gonna kind of end in a stalemate in a lot of ways a lot of death hundreds of thousands of people died in the 80s um under this stuff and then uh then you're going to see iraq then turn to kuwait which was a heavy american ally Thus, you get the Gulf War. So Iran is like, well, that's an easy problem to solve. I'll just blow up all the Kuwaiti oil tankers as well, which is exactly what they do. But here's the catch. Kuwait at this point in time is like the one major exporter of oil that wasn't really part of OPEC, meaning that they were selling oil on the global market significantly cheaper than everybody else, driving down the entire oil market. And um, OPEC is a, is a union of oil producing nations that tries to use their solidarity to be able to keep up prices against especially like uh more like western imperial nations that are really really gonna are really really try to put pressure to get cheap oil now that their oil tankers are getting blown up as Therefore, well it means United that kuwait States can no oil. longer sell oil on the cheap cheap meaning that iran has now inadvertently committed the cardinal sin of the late 20th century raising gas prices now the entire western world looks over the persian gulf like the lot fuck? In the <laughs> the ghost of Sun Tzu's sitting there shaking his head like that's that's the one exception I would have messed with any supply line except for that one because we all know what happens next. God, yeah, America then Navy proceeds hands. to assemble the largest <laughs> naval convoy operation since World War II, send them into the Persian Gulf to protect Kuwaiti oil tankers. Gas it is at this moment so that Iran should have been like, well, that's unfortunate. Time to figure out plan B because this obviously is not going to work out. However, they decide that they're going to double down. What they're going to do is they're going to take a bunch of magnetic underwater mines and they're just going to spread them out all over the Persian Gulf in international waters. And that's not going to have any consequences at all so fast understand forward. how much commerce goes through the persian gulf that's a dangerous or april 14th 1988 the uss samuel b roberts a guided missile frigate which is basically brand new at this point this is like its first big operation is out there escorting a kuwaiti oil Ooh. tanker and it runs into a minefield hits a mine blows up the keel of the ship the keel is this bottom part right here it like supports and stabilizes the yeah, structure of the entire ship Helps and it gets tip. blown completely in half at this point the only thing holding this boat together is the actual deck. One second, everything's fine. The next second, there's a 15 foot wide hole in the bottom of your ship. Everything's on fire and water is rushing in. The USS Samuel B. Roberts took on half of its weight in water in the first minute. This is a catastrophic Jeez. amount of damage that would sink 99% of ships, yeah, but as okay. fate would have it, the crew of the USS Samuel B. Roberts had already been winning competitions for having the best damage control crew in the Navy. So mm. the entire crew gets to work. They're putting out fires, they're plugging holes, 
holes. They're literally cinching the hole together with steel cables trying to stabilize it because the only thing holding it together is a deck at this point. Over the course of the next five hours, the entire crew fights their ass off and somehow manages to get the situation under control and limp the ship all the way back to Dubai where they can get it to a port. And the most incredible part of all of it, not a single American was killed. Only 10 men were injured during the fire and the initial explosion. Wow. So the crew survived. The boats basically completely Wait destroyed. The then America sends in an underwater crew, figure out what happened. They find the remnants of the mine. They check out the other mines. Yep, they're Iranian. At this point, now somebody oh, has gosh. to inform the president because this is a big deal. And the president at this point in time is, let me check my notes, uh, fucking Ronald Reagan. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So they go ahead and they brief <laughs> Ronald Reagan on everything that happened. That's the warning, right? Is that what Reagan said? He's like, the, the scariest thing you should hear is, or the scariest thing you can hear is, um, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. And he's super happy that Take everybody that. survived. And he's like, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to issue a proportional response. And what the U.S. Navy heard was, I All right, so here's the plan. I ran currently. Yeah, that's always, been a, that's always been a thing to try to keep from escalation, but of course, responding to events right yeah proportional response meaning how big the the act was against you you should not try to supersede that by much if at all otherwise it just keeps going back and forth forever he has three oil rigs in the persian gulf that are not being used for drilling oil but as military bases for their naval operations so the u.s navy is going to go ahead and take out all three of those now i don't really know what the guided missile frigate to oil rig exchange ratio is but we're going to go ahead and err on the side of caution and say that it's not quite proportional enough yet <laughs> In GTA so terms. Iran also really only has like two modern naval vessels. That's the Iranian frigate Sahand and the Iranian frigate Sabatland. They're going to go ahead and take out at least one of those, maybe both. We'll see how proportional they want to get. And then by the time they get all that done, that should be a nice eight hour work day. It'll be time to clock out and go get some ice cream. So in order to get all this done by quitting time, they're going to go ahead and establish three different surface attack groups. Each group is going to have two destroyers and one bonus ship. That bonus ship is either going to be an amphibious landing ship or a frigate. Either way, they're all going to be identified as Bravo, Not Charlie, want to go and Delta. Land, Bravo group is tasked with taking out two oil rigs. Charlie group is tasked with taking out the one remaining oil rig. And Delta's mission is to go hunt down those two frigates and take them out. And then just for insurance purposes, we're also going to have the USS Enterprise parked right outside the Persian Gulf to provide air support, you that know, in case we need it. So April 18th, 1988, four days after the mining of the USS Samuel B. Roberts, Operation Praying Mantis goes into full swing and Bravo group shows up at their oil rig first, at which point they radio over to the oil rig and inform them that they will be blowing it up in five minutes and that they should all leave. So a bunch of people start leaving. They hop in tugboats and take off. Bravo group, seeing that they're making an honest Better effort to actually there. evacuate, agrees to give them 15 more minutes. So fast forward 20 minutes later, they send out another radio message. Hey, time's up. They then fire the five inch guns right over the top of the oil rig with the round set to air burst hopefully scaring off any stragglers. And it is at this point that some Iranian military member decides that he is going to audition to be the main character of this story because he hops on a 23 millimeter anti-aircraft gun and opens fire on Bravo group. And without skipping a beat. You chose poorly. Respect the bravery. But... One of the five inch guns on one of the destroyers just goes Nyeh! Poof, and just fucking direct hit smokes this dude. Barely uh, touches the rest of the oil rig. This guy, definitely not the main character, but the silver lining, he at least made it into the credits as baloney miss cloud number one. Now, obviously I'm paraphrasing here, but at this point, Bravo <laughs> group radios over to the oil rig one was, last time. Some dude, that was brutal. Did he say baloney mist? Yeah, I mean, it would only go into the graphic details of what happens if you get hit by something that big. Thing along the lines but, of, hey, whoa. does anybody else need to find out what it's like to chew five gum? Are you fuckers ready to quit? The oil rig finally radios <laughs> back and is like, yeah, yeah, please cease fire. We're going to leave. So all the Iranian military members leave. Bravo group decides to open up on it for a little bit with the five inch guns before sending over a couple of Hueys full of Marines. The Marines hop out, place some demo charges, hop back on the helicopters, take off. The entire oil rig blows up and already things are getting more proportional. And remember, <laughs> just keep it keep in mind again, this is all in response to oil, right? It's showing how historically we have come, we'd come to this point of oil interests right that will that will lead you know can lead nations into this type of activity 
right? How dependent everybody was and how serious every take on the, the historically what we had come to starting with our oil dependency of, you know, our whole lives being run by it. Proportional. And while all that was Rip. happening, Charlie Group made it to their first oil rig as well, and pretty much the exact same thing played out. The only differences were Charlie Group didn't have Marines to place the demo charges, they had Navy SEALs, and when the Iranians opened up with the 23mm anti-aircraft guns, they just decided to keep firing 5-inch shells at the oil platform until it burst into flames and burnt the entire thing to the ground. At which point, the commander of the destroyer kind of looks over at the Navy SEALs and is like, Sorry, I guess you guys get to sit this one out. Oh, the mission got canceled? Good. And while all that's going down, Bravo Group's already making their way over to the third oil rig, at which point they pick up something on radar, and it's definitely another enemy ship headed right towards them. And at this point, you have to remember, this is the late 1980s. None of the American sailors have seen naval warfare on right. this scale. The pucker factor is on. They are getting Not harpoon close. missiles ready. Not even close, right? Uh, I mean, shoot, go back to in the 80s vietnam and even then it's uh then, then you have it, yeah then you have the issues of like late gulf and stuff like that so yeah it's one of the most inexperienced things that that generation would have gone through Amer through american history would be naval combat right because it has so much especially if you're talking about direct combat right between actual ships versus ships since world war ii or since korean war ii so that's a big gap. And they are about to get gap. in like Historic. one of the biggest naval fights since World War II. At which point, whoever's in charge of Bravo Group decides to take a deep breath and they're like, okay, let's just, let's send up a helicopter real quick just to verify that it's actually an enemy ship. So the helicopter goes up, radios back to Bravo Group. It's definitely a warship, but it's a Soviet destroyer. At which point everybody's like, what? What is happening right now? So they radio over to this Russian destroyer and they're like, what are your intentions? And the Russian commander radios back in broken English. I swear to God, this is a real quote. Okay. I'm just here to take pictures for history. <laughs> Look, I know that I bash on the Soviet. I'm again. just here to take pictures for history. Look, I know that I bash on the Soviet. Historians willing to put themselves on the lines. I mean, I don't know if we're going to believe that. It's just like... We're the press, but we're in a we're in a Soviet warship. You gotta remember all this stuff is is still part of Cold War politics and Cold War economics, right? Anytime you see these types of things, these interactions, if the United States is gonna be showing up somewhere, you better believe the Soviet Union is going to be there in the shadows, uh, at least, right? This is still there's proxy wars still going. It's still the eighties, even if it's the late eighties. Um, this is still part of the larger context of the Cold War. Soviet Union and communism every single chance I get, but this time around, I got to give it to them. These guys know how to part Soviet Union and com take back pictures to his whole thing. for history. Look, I know that I bash on the Soviet Union and communism every single chance I get, but this time around, I got to give it to them. These guys know how to party. Just straight up rolling into the middle of the largest naval operation since World War II to eat <laughs> popcorn and watch. It's incredible. At this point, Iran finally figures out that there's something going on, but they don't really know what, so they just begin attacking any ship they can find. They're gonna and the be there first ship orders. they found was a civilian cargo ship called the Willy Tide that they begin attacking with bog Ooh. hammer style speedboats. So the Willy Tide radios for help. The USS Enterprise responds by sending up a bunch of A6 intruders as well as F14 Tomcats. The A6 intruders show up, start dropping there's cluster bombs, gun. they end up hitting one of OG the speedboats and scattering the rest. The civilian cargo ship is saved. Hooray! Cutting back to Charlie Group, now there's an Iranian fast attack ship coming right at them. So we're they radio over like, hey, yeah, we're kind of going around blowing up all your stuff, but also we've got a very specific list. You're not on it. So how about you just go away and we'll forget we saw you. The Iranian fast attack ship messages back. Sounds good. We'll do that. And then they just keep driving right towards them. And then this Iranian fast attack ship gets within like 15 miles of Charlie Group, which is like point blank range for a naval battle. Charlie Group radios again, dude, Crazy. what are you doing? The to which is. they respond, I'm following orders. And then they proceeded to lock their radar on Charlie Group, which Charlie Group can see. Doesn't at which like point that. Charlie Group immediately launches five missiles directly at the Iranian vessel. The Iranian vessel fires a harpoon missile back at Charlie Group. Both groups now have missiles in the air screaming towards one another. The Americans launch countermeasures shooting up chaff rockets that end up catching the harpoon missile, detonating it in midair. The Iranian vessel, on the other hand, did not have any countermeasures mm -hmm. capable of stopping the newer technology 
technology behind the American missiles, and it would end up getting sunk pretty much immediately. Then, before anybody can really even fully digest what just happened, Radar picks up three Iranian F-4s screaming towards Charlie Group. Charlie Group then turns, fires a bunch of surface-to-air missiles at the F-4s. Got the F-4s see them though. coming, they're like, oh shit, they pop they a U-turn and try to outrun them. F-4s, while they are extremely fast, can't outrun missiles, so one of the missiles ends up blowing a wing off one of the F-4s. Now America has taken out an entire naval vessel and an F-4 that they did not plan on taking out, and it's throwing off all of our proportions. And because of that, American leadership orders Bravo Group to stand down, we're not gonna go take out that third oil rig, and right as soon as that order gets given out, Delta Group chimes in as like, hey, we found that frigate we were looking for. So now nobody knows what to do because on one hand, things are already That's getting out of control, but on the other hand, we really want to take out these frigates. Right. So American leadership decides. So yeah, okay, so we see what they decide, but this this puts you in a, a, yeah, in a position because um, it's like the thing you're looking for in the first place has now shown up, but there's always already been incredible amount of, of, of devastation. You see how the political decisions and the military decisions all come all have they all have to intertwine at some point and try to make <laughs> out of the situation i guess what you will and what you hope for in the end which they say is a proportional response but these are things that are always happen historically in wars and stuff like that with decisions being made intertwining of politics and military it's hard as well, we might not even have to make a hard decision. Maybe that's not even the frigate and the radar's wrong. Why don't you go ahead and send a couple A6 intruders over, do a flyby, a they can verify that it's actually this new modern frigate, and if it is, we'll make a decision from there. Or so they thought, because the A6 pilots are about to decide that they are in fact the main characters of this story. You see, the USS Enterprise and its aircraft aren't really supposed to be doing a whole lot, they're more or less just there for insurance. In fact, right. they're only allowed to engage the enemy under one of two conditions. One, the president of the United States signs off on it, which is actually what happened with the speedboats earlier, or two, they get fired upon first. So they got told to go fly by this boat to verify that it is in fact the new modern history. frigate, but they didn't get told how to fly by the boat. So they drop down 50 feet above the water and just gun it and they buzz the entire ship. So the ship opens fire with its AA guns, but these planes are Ooh. so low to the water, the AA guns can't actually aim down low enough. So oh. all the anti-aircraft fire goes right over the top of them. They continue to stay low enough till they get out of anti-aircraft gun range, That's and then they pull low. up, at which point the ship launches a bunch of surface-to-air missiles at them. They drop chaff as a countermeasure, takes care of those, no big deal. They then go around, do a U-turn, send a radio message to this frigate, I'm going to sink you now. Which they can now <laughs> legally do, because remember, the ship fired on them first. But then again, it's, it's, oh man, these decisions are crazy, because it's like, you don't know who's going to shoot first. And when you feel under threat, your decisions are going to change. You have, you have this planes going 50 feet, 50 feet. It's like, how could that not be seen as potentially very, very dangerous? But then again, so are, are the, the, um, the American pilots and stuff. So are they, are they baiting them? Is that what it is? You know, good, good chance they are right. All right, what do we got for some, uh, what's this, Princess Bride? One of the classic blunders. So the A-6 fires right, an anti-ship Princess harpoon Bride. missile, and the second they pull the trigger on that, the fire control team from the USS Enterprise is like, what we got the, response the fuck they are you doing? We're not supposed to be killing things right. yet. And the A-6s are like, look, they fired at us first. Them's the rules. And the USS Enterprise is like, holy shit, okay, I guess. Let them have it. Then the harpoon missile finally makes impact. It's a bullseye. The A6s do a U-turn, go drop another 500 pound laser guided bomb right through the deck of this frigate, fly past it, do another U-turn, come back, drop a thousand pound bomb on it. Then they radio over to the Enterprise and like, yeah, it's definitely gonna sink. We're gonna oh, head back. Uh... So the A6s take off, headed back to the Enterprise. And like five minutes later, Delta Group shows up with their warships and begin firing on the already sinking frigate. They hit the magazine, the frigate explodes, rapidly sinks to the ocean floor. At this point, naval leadership is like, okay, Jesus Christ, everybody stop killing things. We need to figure out what all happened. We got to keep this proportional, remember. <laughs> So they start radioing back and forth. Everybody's figuring out what everybody did, if anybody's hurt, what's going on, the whole story. And then as the A6s are making their way back to the USS Enterprise, guess what they happen to fly past? The other modern frigate. So now the entire U.S. Navy is looking at this last frigate like SpongeBob looking at a jug of water. I don't need it. I don't need it. I need it. 
Oh, gosh. But also, like, realistically speaking, the A6s are pretty much out of ammunition. The only thing they have left are 2,000-pound bombs, and those just aren't going to be enough by themselves without a harpoon missile to take down this ship anyways, so they really are just going to fly by and verify that it's the modern frigate. So the A6 intruders go ahead. They the frigate doesn't know that. The frigate doesn't know that. How are they going to respond? Do their flyby. It is, in fact, the new frigate that they thought it was, and it does, in fact, open fire on the A6s. A6s make it out completely unscathed, at which point they pop a U-turn, and one of the A6 pilots is like, hmm. It's the bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. So the A6 pulls up, gaining altitude, and then dives down, aims its nose right at the frigate at, like, a 35-degree angle. They're doing a good old-fashioned dive bombing run like Those it's fucking so World War II. Yeah, the AA guns start firing. There's like bullets midway and pass the plane, but they're committed now. They're closing in, closing in. The bombardier behind the pilot lets the pilot know, hey, I'm locked on. At which point, bombs away, the pilot pulls up, and the bomb goes right down the fucking smokestack of oh this my boat. God. Blows up, Directed. completely destroying the entire engine room. That frigate is now dead in the water with no power. The A6s shot. go ahead and radio yeah. in that they have completely disabled this frigate, at which point the American leadership calls a complete ceasefire. They're going to go ahead and let that frigate survive, get towed off, potentially be repaired. With the U.S. Navy having effectively disabled or destroyed over half of Iran's functioning Navy, the U.S. military decides to call it a good day, ends Operation Praying Mantis, we all get to live happily ever after. Except, later that night, Iran decided that they wanted to fight a little bit more, and they launched a bunch of silkworm anti-ship missiles at American vessels. Luckily, no American vessels were actually hit. However, this is now a huge political problem because exactly. America has been mad at the fact that Iran even had silkworm missiles for years at this point, and the American government has made it very clear to Iran that if they ever used them, they would be going to war with America, period. That's set in stone. Got I gotta add context here because Iranian revolution, um, hostage crisis, Iranian hostage crisis. This United States and Iran have had issues for decades. Um, right now, one of the videos that I covered recently, and he's doing a series, is uh, Jack Rackham. He's doing one on um, the, well, it's bigger than the Iranian revolution, but the regime changes and stuff that United States was also a part of, um, of propping up unpopular leaders because they had more favorable policies towards um, uh, trade in the West. And so this, there's been conflict with the United States and Iran for a long time. This is not out of nowhere. It's not just this current gas thing. Okay. It's been going on a long, long time, which brings a lot of context. I'm hoping for anyone listening to me here about the uh, modern uh, political problems, the United States and Iran has had and has continued to have, you can see this goes back many decades, many decades, really, especially since the end of World War II. So the Reagan administration, not wanting to kick off World War III in the 1980s, reaches out to the Iranian government and is like, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go ahead and admit that that was an accident. I'm going to sweep it under the rug and we're never going to talk about it again. Because if this makes headline news and the American people find out, I'm going to have to get real proportional around here. So Iran's like, OK, Dude. fine, whatever. It was an accident. Let's sweep that whole thing under the rug. By the way, this is, I didn't mean to cut them off, but uh, this is, I want to make sure uh, it's understood too, that these type of actions with proxy involvements or direct involvements um, happened a lot and are not talked about a lot in uh, modern U.S. history that, you know, it, it's like, you know, it's, a lot of people kind of believe you had like World War II, then you had like Vietnam and Korea, and then that was basically it as far as American involvement in things. And, and um, there's so much more. Okay, politically, look at all of Latin America. Um, again, the Middle East, you get all this stuff. There's so much missing context that people aren't aware of that explains perfectly the public relations problems, or not public or foreign foreign relations problems and and uh that are out there. And it's where people are so devoid of the context all over the place. But one of those ways that that's been able to um happen. Okay, without really American public knowing is how successful intelligence actually is um, like CIA intelligence, whatever it is at, at um, keeping some of these things kind of under wraps. Cause these are like major events, you know what I mean? And especially since the, uh, with the Vietnam war and how unpopular that had become for so many Americans, it was very, very important that, uh, that things like this don't get out very much. Otherwise you're going to get more and more unrest by the population.
in the United States. But I am still gonna take America to international court to try to prove that it was a war crime to take out my oil rigs. That way I can get reparations and make America pay for it. So they go to international court, they yep. lay out the case. The international court is looking at America like, okay, well, first of all, you're the fraction people. I don't know how you think that this is proportional, but it definitely wasn't. Yeah. Second of all, according to the Amity Act, you absolutely should not have attacked their oil rigs. This is probably a war crime. At which point the representative for America is like, well, actually, if you read the Amity Treaty between Iran and the United Let's States, it only talks about ships and boats. It don't say shit about oil rigs, meaning oh, I wasn't obligated to not attack those oil rigs, at which point the court is like, hold on, it. hold on, hold on. <sighs> Fucking, he's right, son of a bitch. Okay, well, I guess America's innocent because oh I've gosh. said it once and I'll say it again. It's never a war crime the first time. And now for the best part of the entire story, America now proceeds to go over to Dubai. Pick yeah, you know, you know, they're I don't know if they did, but I would, I would be like, you know, they're revising those agreements after that. Up what's left of the USS Samuel B. Roberts, tow it all the way back to Maine, then take the ship out of the water, get Jeez. it in dry dock, cut out the entire damaged section of the ship, including the you engine compartment, it? build another module to fit in its place. This thing weighs like 300 tons. They jack it up, weld it right where it's at, get everything rehooked up, reconnected. And this boat is back out on the ocean one year later on April 1st, 1989. It then goes on to get American recommissioned Industry. and serves in the Insane. Navy until 2015. It's I mean, playing battleship industry. against America has got to suck, right? Like, haha, I've sunk your frigate. And America's like, first of all, no, you didn't. Second of all, fuck your entire Navy as it picks up your board and just throws it at the wall. So in conclusion, if you do ever find yourself being the leader of a foreign nation one day, the best advice that I can possibly give you is A, do whatever you can to not raise gas prices, and B, whatever you do, do not fuck with America's boats. We do not like that shit. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is like, comment, subscribe, maybe go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack, bang, out. Final thoughts. All right, so I'd heard of that story in passing, but again, like these videos I've I've covered from him, he goes into so much more detail, but makes it, you know, interesting there. I love his his, his style is very, very uh, kind of entertaining for um, for storytelling purposes. Great, great storyteller there. But yeah, it, it, hopefully I was able to interject all the big context stuff that is kind of void from this. Um, because it explains so much more. These aren't random encounters, right? Um, you know, after World War II, with the United States Soviet Union becoming superpowers, the beginning of the Cold War, it's amazing what changed with American foreign. Uh, so much changed with with American foreign policy, uh, especially outside of like like um, Monroe Doctrine style, like outside of the Western Hemisphere type of things. So yeah, you can see that going on. But hopefully, what I was able to add there again was the context that defines and, and explains a lot more of the relationship between the United States and Iran because it goes deeper than this event um, and that it goes, of course, later as well. So anyway, okay, great recommendation from there. Um, there's some other videos I know have been recommended. I want to know what the next one is I should do. This one I'm seeing, I saw on my screen there as we were leaving, it's Lewis Millet, Fix Bayonets. Uh, that is another one that seems to be popular that gets, gets uh, recommended to me. Let me know if that's the one I should do next. Um, and we'll see what's going on. So again, with that original video, make sure you support Fat Electrician. Come on back and hopefully we'll uh, get you taken care of some more with covering some more of this stuff. All right, with that, we'll see you all next time.